So we'll just make wait a little bit, confirm it is streaming. It is streaming now. Uh, I installed a little uh, utility program uh, because you know how in Windows you can click the uh, control key and then the the mouse would kind of ping, you know, to let you know where it is. So I have an equivalent tool in Linux now, except it is a little bit more utilitarian like this. So you just put a crosshair, you know, at where the cursor is instead of just you know, pinging it. I like it better this way. All right, so <clears throat> what we'll do today is to continue our discussion with subroutines, okay? Um, with this class, you guys are once again, you know, ahead of the other class because Monday was a holiday for the Monday class and, you know, you guys did not have a, you know, a holiday, which is kind of good in a way. We'll lose one day because of Thanksgiving, okay? So, you know, so that will just kind of rebalance everything a little bit. All right, so what we'll do is I'm going to pick one of these. No, not the calendar. I need to go to Canvas. Where's Canvas? Come on. Okay, we'll start from here. And then let's pick a lock in again. There we go. All right, so what we'll do today is we're continuing our discussion. I'm hoping everybody had a chance to look into how a subroutine is called and when a subroutine is done, how it is returning back to the caller. Is that okay? Because you know that's kind of what we talked about and that's also what the previous lab is about. So are there any questions about you know, how a subroutine is called and how a subroutine returns to the caller by making use of the stack? So let me just go to the slide first so that we can we know where we are at at this point. So we were talking about this particular slide here, uh, calling and returning from subroutines. So do we have any specific question about this module before I move on and start to talk about how to return a scalar value, which is like super duper simple. And then the next one is going to be harder because you know how we make use of parameters and local variables. That one is a little bit more involved, but returning a scalar value is like, easy. So do we have any questions about, you know, calling and returning and how the stack is organized? No questions? Okay. So if there are no questions, uh, I'm going to move on to talk about how to return a scale of value. <clears throat> so if you open this up, you will find that this is one of the kind of really, really short module. Okay. You can tell from the scroll bar right here, you know, how short it is. So the way we do it is we just choose a register. So you know, it's just a convention um, that I choose to use register A uh, to store the return value of a subroutine. Okay, so because I choose register A, you have to play by those same rules in order for programs to be, to be able to interoperate, okay? So that means if you have a subroutine like this, okay, the subroutine name is five itself, and in C code, it is returning a constant of five. The equivalent code in assembly, okay, let me just scroll down a little bit. You will see how simple it is. Oh, okay, I cannot scroll down any further because that's it. Okay, so the equivalent TTP code is <clears throat> the name of the subroutine becomes the label because you know, it is basically marking the entry point of the subroutine. And this is it. Line two, li A5, is the way we specify a return value of five. So whatever return value you want to specify, put it into register A. It is an agreement between the caller and the subroutine being called that the return value would be register A. So is that okay? All right. Line two, uh, look, excuse me, line three, uh, line two, three, four, and five are the typical return uh, sequence which we have already talked about on Tuesday, okay? So the lab on Tuesday talks about this a little bit as well. So are we good so far with how a scalar value is returned? Does anyone have any question about what, what constitutes a scalar value in general in C and C++? No question? Anything that is not complex, basically. So a char is a scalar, an int is a scalar, regardless of the width or number of bits. Um, a double is also considered a scalar. 
So all of those are returned via a register. Now you might say, you know, in the, T in the TTP, register is only a bit wide, so we are only capable of returning characters or unsigned a bit numbers. But on an actual, you know, computer or processor like the AMD or the uh, Intel processor, because it's a 64-bit architecture, so each register has 64 is 64 bit wide. So that means using a single register, it is capable of returning a double or a 64 bit signed or unsigned integer up to 64 bits. Is that okay? So this, this convention is not my convention. If you look at most architectures and how most compilers compile code, they would just choose one register, typically register A if there's one, as the register to store a return value. So this is not my convention at all. You know, I'm just borrowing convention from existing tools. Yep, it, it'll come back. <clears throat> I still don't know why it's doing this. It could be a contact issue. So do we have any questions about this particular module? Question? Mm, there's only one stack for one, for one thread. I almost misspoke, okay? I almost said, you know, there's only one stack per process, but that is actually not true. If you have a multi-threading process, each thread has its own stack. Um, but with a 64-bit architecture, there's only, you know, unless you, it is multi-threaded, there's only one stack. Mm -hmm. Yep. What, which part is standardized? The stack. The stack? So the concept of using a stack is fairly universal across almost all architectures. Um, there are some architectures, some CISC architectures, that implicitly has the notion of a stack because they got instructions specifically for pushing, popping, calling, and returning. Okay, so they're, com they're basically combining, you know, these three lines of code, you know, three lines three, four, and five, and, you know, make a return instruction, you know, to do all those three things. Yep. What I was asking was, is there like a specific register that is used for the stack? Yes. So there are two types of architectures, you know, in addition to CISC versus RISC, there are also two variations. Um, so there are four variations if you think about it that way, okay? So there are architectures called special purpose register architecture, where certain registers can only be used in certain operators to do certain things. So with those particular architectures, the stack pointer is usually called a special purpose register, which usually means you cannot use the stack pointer in a regular addition, subtraction, or some of the other instructions. It can only be used for chain popping, calling, and returning. But uh, more modern architectures tend to use what we call general purpose architecture, which means you know, there's no differentiation between the registers at all you know, at the hardware level. So which one you designate as the stack pointer is completely a convention that the compiler chooses. So does that kind of answer your question? So there are all kinds of variations. Um, the, the TTP is closer to a more modern archi architecture where all, the four, all four registers are considered equivalent in the sense that you know, if an instruction works on one, it will work on the other registers as well. <clears throat> so this really kind of helps to prepare you for um, more modern architectures that you might you know, come across when you need to do assembly level you know, programming. Is that okay? Cool, all right. <clears throat> so here's a question that is kind of related but not directly related to what we are talking about here. What kind of, why do you think you need to do assembly level programming now that we have C, C++, Java, what is the new programming language from, uh, uh, for Android? Mm -hmm. um, and then we have Swift on the side of Apple and so on. So with all of these high-level programming languages, why do you think people still need to learn how to program in assembly? Well, 
So just to answer that question a little bit, I know it is not entirely related to the the knowledge you know, that I want to you know, uh, you know uh, talk about in this class. But if you look into okay, I would go to a particular place which is kind of cool. Uh, if you are planning to become a computer engineer or a electro electrical engineer, this is one of the really kind of interesting websites. Um, DigiKey is a uh, distributor of electronic parts, so they can distribute everything from individual transistors uh, to you know resistors. But they also sell you know larger components like you know Arduino boards, um, Raspberry Pis, and so on. But to be more specific for this topic, I want to look up the part called AT Tiny, <clears throat> and then we can do we will look up the, uh, the categories. Okay, so th these are microcontrollers. So the term micro oh, okay, I shouldn't have clicked on it. So the term microcontroller basically is talking about a single chip solution. We are talking about one single IC that has the processor, it has the RAM, it also has um, well, I, okay, I have to clarify this, but I will say it first. So it has got the processor, RAM, ROM, and also input-output devices. But in this case, the so-called ROM is flash. Okay, It is not corresponding to our microcode ROM, because in these architectures, it's called, these are not von Neumann architectures. There's a different name for these architectures. It's called a Harvard architecture, like the university. Okay, so the difference between this and the architecture like the, uh, the TTP is the program lives in one memory space, which is flash based, and then your variables and the stack lives on a different space, which is the RAM space. So there are two different spaces, one for the code and one for data with the Harvard architecture. So you might ask, why do we want to do it this way? Because this way you have two different, entirely different memory devices and things can go a lot faster because you don't have the contention. The contention is, you know, when you need to fetch instructions, it is using the same bus as when you need to fetch uh, data for operating. When you need to store something, you're storing into the same space using the same bus as what you need to fetch the next opcode. So that contention, you know, makes it impossible or very difficult to pipeline, you know, the processor to make it go faster. The Harford architecture, on the other hand, because it has two entirely different memory devices and two entirely different buses, they can work at the same time, which makes pipelining you know, very easy to implement, and that increases the throughput of um, processing in those architectures. So that's why you know, they, they use a slightly different architecture, uh, but that's not even what I want to illustrate. What I do want to illustrate <clears throat> is well, there are several things here that are kind of interesting already um, because you can tell that, okay, so we'll, we can look at all of these filters. You can see the speed of some of these, these devices can go all the way down to just one megahertz. And they, they don't go up very high either. They only go up to like 20 megahertz. So you look at these and go like, why do we want to even consider processors like these? I mean, one megahertz is really slow. Your, you know, your desktop computer, you know, typically, even if, uh, with a cheap one, with a dirt cheap one, um, they still operate at about one gigahertz, okay? You know, you, you will have difficulty to get something to clock down below 800, meg uh, megahertz, the, me 800 megahertz these days. So why do we want to look at these processors? And then you look at the other resources available. Now, this is what I mean by you know, the program space versus the RAM space. You can see they're separate, okay? And you are not reading this incorrectly. You, in fact, got this right. 512 bytes. That's the entire space to store your program. It's 512 bytes. It still beats TTP, right? The toy processor only has 256 locations. So this one has got you know, 512 bytes for the program space. But when you look at RAM space, it's even, it's even more ridiculous. Because RAM size is 32 locations. Each location has 8 bits, which means it has 32 bytes. 64 bytes, 128 bytes. And the best of this bunch is 2,000 bytes, 2,048 bytes to be exact. That's your entire memory space. Your stack, all your variables, everything has to fit in within 2048 bytes. 
Are we, are we doing okay so far? And these are currently produced parts, okay? We are not talking about historical parts from the 80s, okay? So we'll pick you know, one of these you know, as a selection criteria. We'll pick the biggest one of this, okay? So we will pick a fancy part. <clears throat> and then we'll apply the filter. Okay, let's see if we can narrow down to something. This is also interesting. Um, these parts have you know, uh, IO pins or input output pins. So the parts that I have selected has you know, from 12 to 22 input output pins. So these input output pins, you know, basically they cannot drive a whole lot, maybe an LED or something like that to light up something. But if you wanted to drive anything like a motor, you will need to have a different circuit to shield the MCU from you know, the driver circuit to drive a motor. But nonetheless, there are 32, 12 to 22 points of contact that it can, it can be used to either to sense something or to turn something on and off. And that's a lot, okay? If you think about it, that's really quite a lot. Um, so we'll also take a look at the packaging. So when you look at your know, supplier device package, um, these are very small packages, especially you know, the VQFN. And because I think this three by three means it is three by three millimeters. Okay, how, how thick or how wide is three millimeters? Take six lead, uh, mechanical pencil lead that are like 0.5 millimeter each, line them up, okay, side by side, you know, six of them. That's how wide the chip is. <laughs> you can fit a whole on the fingernail of your, of your pinky. <laughs> okay, all right, but that's not even the most important, interesting part. So we'll go ahead and look at all the parts retrieved here. And what we'll do is we're gonna look at the price each, okay? So if you buy 1500 at a time, each one is 77 cents, okay? So, you know, in, in the world of manufacturing, okay, buying 1500 at a time is nothing, okay? You know, because most of the time when your product is ready to, to roll out, You'll be probably rolling out, you know, you know, if tens of thousands of parts, not you know, just like fifteen hundred parts. Okay, so that means you know the realistic price for a manufacturer is seventy cents, seventy seven cents for each processor, for each microprocessor. I take it back, microcontroller, because the microcontroller includes the processor, RAM, ROM, and input output devices. It does not need any extra parts to run. You just give it power and ground, get it programmed, and it goes. It does not need extra parts. Is that okay? Um, so if you buy just one at a time, the so minimum quantity is one, then you have to pay a little bit more. It's still less than a dollar. If I give you a dollar bill right now, what can you buy on this campus? You go to a vendor machine, right? You know, I got a dollar bill. You put a dollar bill in and you, you click all the buttons. They say, nope, not enough funding, not enough fund, not enough fund. <laughs> hmm? See? Does it, is, is it a buck? <laughs> so there are things that, that are still costing less than a dollar. But if you go to Starbucks on campus and you say, okay, here's a dollar, give me something that's, you know, that's about a dollar, you know, there won't be anything. Yep. What is the SOIC? SOIC is, um, let's see, that's packaging. Where is that uh, over here? That's the only thing I see that's different. Oh, this one here? Yeah, 20 SOIC means you know, it's a 20 pin package which means you know, there are 10 pins on each side. Um, SOIC is Small Outline Integrated Circuit. That's basically, that's the, uh, the acronym, not acronym, but the abbreviation of Small Outline Integrated Circuit. So this is not the smallest you know, footprint. Um, a 20 pin SOIC is, I would say it's about the size of, a, of, your, of the fingernail of your, on your pinky. So that's about the size of a 20 pin SOIC. The really small ones are the ones that I just mentioned earlier, 
you know, those are the really small ones. You know, it, you cannot even hand solder those things. Yep. So if you were building, for example, a toy with a voice box, you mm -hmm. like Yes. So these chips are not only inexpensive, but they also are specialized to, uh, to have sleep mode to minimize power consumption. So let's think about a Fitbit, okay? And I got two fitness devices on my hand. So let's think about these things, okay? So, um, okay, let me, let me take it off so you can see it, All right? There we go. See this blinking here? This is how it, you know, senses, you know, my poses, okay? Because you know, the light gets reflected and depending on, you know, uh, whether there's you know a pulse of blood you know underneath the skin the, the reflectance changes so this is how it picks up you know my pulses um and you can see it blink right yeah. right okay so if you can see something blink that means the blink frequency is going to be less than you know 20 hertz okay because anything that's faster than 30 hertz you probably won't see it blink at all if i move it around you will see it blink but if it's stationary, you wouldn't see it blinking. If you can actually see it blinking when it's like stationary or still, that means you know the blinking frequency is like much less than 20 hertz. Okay, so which is fast enough to pick up my pulses, right? Because you know my maximum heart rate is, I mean, even for a person who's really fit and young, the maximum heart rate should not exceed you know like 220. So if you compare 220 times per minute versus um like you know 10 times per second 10 times per second you know, is way over sampling already okay so with these chips okay what you can do is it can wake up okay uh, turn on the led okay and then it go back to sleep because it takes a little bit of time for the led to you know, to get to the full brightness okay when the led gets to the full brightness it wakes itself up again which is within maybe you know a few hundred microseconds okay not even a millisecond and then it will turn on it will read um the analog value back you know like how much reflectance and whatnot and then it will put it into a buffer and then it goes back to sleep and then we'll go back to sleep for you know a few milliseconds which is a lot of time okay so the on duty cycle of the processor is very 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 small and during the time when it does sleep, okay, it does, it con it, I cannot say it consumes no power or consumes no energy, but it is very, very low energy consumption during that time. Okay, so this is very specialized programming. It is programming, you know, in a way, but it's very, very specialized. So the, so if you can get some of the jobs done, you know, like the you know, sampling, collecting the data, putting everything into a buffer, if you can get those done, using a chip like this, okay? So that means the more powerful processor on the Fitbit can only, only has to wake up every five seconds, for instance, okay? So the main processor will wake up every five seconds and then look into the buffer and say, okay, little processor, how much data have you collected for me? Okay, I've collected these you know, thousands of you know, samples. Then the main processor will go in and you know, analyze the poses, analyze you know, the feedback, uh, identify the poses, add the count you know, to whatever memory it has in, you know, in, on the chip, and then it goes back to sleep. Okay, so that means you know these smaller devices, you know, even though they cannot do a whole lot, you cannot implement a full TCP/IP stack on it. Okay, you cannot do you know a lot of things you cannot. Do, okay, you cannot implement you know, a file system on these chips, but that's not what they're for. What they're really for is to control some, you know, uh, other devices. And, you know, they also are very good at, you know, saving power. That is why, you know, we still need to learn how to program in assembly. Because when you, when you only have 2,000 bytes to play with, you cannot just say, oh, I, I'll just use C++. Because C++, the code compiled by C++, or I should say the object code, that is uh, the compiled form from C++ is actually pretty, has a lot of overhead, okay? And as a result, you know, even C is too much, you know, on some of these processors because there's no RAM to speak of. They only got registers. We got 32 registers and no RAM. So you have to program those things in assembly language. Yep. 
Um, you can quite easily get one of these, you know, onto a breadboard. Um, even though the packaging, you know, doesn't fit onto a breadboard, um, there are plenty of manufacturers that can sell a what they call an adapter board. So you solder a 20 SOIC onto an adapter board, but the adapter board will plug onto a breadboard. So once you have something on the breadboard, now you can hook up external resistors, you know, LEDs and whatnot to it. Mm -hmm. There's no class that I'm aware of being taught here that would make use of these chips. Um, the electronics, ET, you know, electronic technology department over, you know, at TechEd, they have some classes that talk about, you know, microcontrollers, but not nearly to the degree to um, actually program these things, you know, for what they are for. Yep. But this is a very specialized branch of programming. <clears throat> With the increase of mobile devices, okay, um, I would say you know, the uh, job market for specialized programming with these chips would only increase if it's not going to decrease. So just a little detour to talk about you know, why we still talk about programming in assembly. Um, and interestingly, in, very interestingly, the power saving mode of these chips is from executing the halt instruction. <laughs> the halt instruction of these chips actually has a specialized um, feature where you know you can program, you can you can configure the chip to basically turn off the clock or you know disable the main clock when it gets into when it executes a halt instruction. So the question is, how does it get out of a halt instruction, right? Because if you're in a halt instruction, it's you're stuck there forever. It's an interrupt. Okay, we haven't really talked about the concept of an interrupt, but when we, when I, when we do get there, you know, I hope you remember the context because an interrupt can get um, this processor out of the halt instruction, so it can actually continue to do something else. So very interesting type of programming. They are not your usual ordinary, you know, you know CISP three hundred and sixty type of programming with these chips, um, but the possibilities are, are just it's just fascinating. Because you, if you think about what you can put a processor into, okay, you know, we, we, we look at something, right? We got cell phones, you know, we got, you know, smart watches and whatnot. What about a wrench? A wrench? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Excuse me. <laughs> what about, you know, a spanner? <laughs> Why would you want to, want to put a processor in a spanner? Mm, not necess not just automation. Torque sensing. Torque sensing. Okay, you know. I won't. I, I would not even put an LED on the branch itself. You know, I would you know make it a Bluetooth thing, so that you know your phone is going to be connected to your hand tool. So you, you program your phone, okay? You say, you know, I need the torque range to be between, you know, 20 foot pound and 25 foot pound. It's, it's acceptable within that range, okay? So as you torque, whatever thing you're torquing, you know, you will, you will hear something audible from your phone, right? You know, it will just say, okay, you know, a little more, a little more, uh, just a little bit more right there, you're good, okay? It is a billion dollar idea. Because what is the cost of over torquing something or under torquing something? Has anyone tried to, or has anyone heard of stories of under torquing the lug nut of a car? What happens? Very bad things. You can have a whole wheel flying off on the highway. That actually happened to my wife's uncle when he was driving on the highway because somebody forgot to torque the lug nuts down. So the entire wheel flew off in, you know, when he was driving on the highway. So the car came to a stop only on three of the four wheels. <laughs> Fortunately, it was one of the back you know, wheels that flew off. So it did not impact your braking performance or steering performance too much. It, if it was one of the front wheels, you know, bad, very bad things would happen. Yep, go ahead. Yep. But you don't want to over torque either, right? You know, because. Yep. 
it might you might strip it yep you know the worst thing is you might strip it or you might actually torque the nut so much that the nut itself is about to break you know you have already done you know um basically structural damage to the to the nut itself or to the bolt itself usually so you know it, it might break you know if that breaks you know then you know pff, you know, there's no repair then you know it's it's bad but you can yeah so something like this can be integrated into an, 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 an inexpensive hand tool okay you know even a screwdriver okay you know you go to harbor freight you pick up a you know five dollar you know screwdriver okay so what 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 do you think you know if if harbor freight starts to offer like a screwdriver that's a little bit more expensive let's say twenty dollars okay that has a rechargeable battery inside that it has you know kind of wireless recharging has bluetooth capability and can tell you how much torque is being applied would you spend the 15 extra dollars not at harbor freight right <laughs> hmm? swap the screws that requires mechanization right or motorization you know so that that's going to incur a lot more cost because the things that are electronic are super duper you know dirt cheap but once once you get into mechanical parts then it starts to get a little more expensive mm -hmm. yep Yep. Well, a Fitbit does not have, you know, it might have some co-processors that is of this particular caliber, but it also has a much more powerful processor too, because it has to implement the Bluetooth stack, which is fairly complex and cannot be done using something like this. And then the battery is also expensive too, you know, you know, on, you know, well, they're getting less expensive, but, you know, it's one of the more expensive components in a mobile device. Yep. You also have to consider shipping, construction, yeah. and what they put on for overhead, and then what stores mark on top of that, they usually mark it up, you know, 10 to 20% of what they got it for. Yeah, sure. But most of the time they, they price it at, you know, what, what people are willing to pay not so much you know how much it costs but this gives you an idea right you know what kind of stuff you know you can incorporate the processor into your backpack can have a one of these processors incorporated into it you know combined with a um, accelerometer okay you can program it to know to to alert you when you're when it's not supposed to be moving Right, you know, it can be blinking. It can start to disperse, you know, pepper spray and whatnot, you know, <laughs> automatically. Right? Yeah. Um, they are used in certain modernized, you know, equipment, and these things usually go into something, you know, where it is not the main processor. It's one of the co-processors to perform, you know, one particular task. So it is being controlled or it reports back to another processor that is in charge of you know, the coordination so these are just the branches of like the bigger processor right if you yeah if you think about you know uh, uh in a car okay so most modern cars have a tire pressure sensor that is inside the wheel right you know that's on the wheel and inside the tire so those things you know you, you don't want to have to open up your tires because you know the the sensor is running out of battery right i mean that's that's going to be a big hassle so those things need to have kind of like a really long battery life um they don't have a very they don't have a very complex thing to do all they have to do is to report back the the battery wirelessly so you know these things you know or some of the bigger ones of these would be um, a good application you know for doing that sort of thing um, you can have a dedicated processor like this, okay, because it's only costing a dollar for a uh, ping detection, you know, on the engine block. So instead of having the, the sensor to go all the way back to the engine control unit and have the engine control unit to do all the processing, you can have one of these things as a co-processor for ping detection, okay? And then it just communicates back to the main processor and go like, well, I'm, you know, detecting, you know, pings, maybe you should change the timing, you know, of the ignition. So there are all kinds of applications. I mean, you, you, if you, you can also think about, you know, putting just a whole bunch of these, you know, sensors along the exhaust manifold, uh, the exhaust 
the entire exhaust run. Okay, so you can detect you know temperature change and so on and so forth. You know that might help identify certain problems too. So all kinds of you know interesting things you can do with when processors are so inexpensive. Any other? Yep, yeah, go ahead. Why do I have two Fitbits? Okay, that's the answer. The answer is actually pretty simple. This one is old. It doesn't have um, uh, SPO2 or post ox um, sensing, you know, which senses you know, uh, uh, blood oxygen saturation. So this one doesn't have it because it's an older you know, uh, Fitbit. But it's the, the pulse uh, and step count is very good with this one, you know, and I'm not ready to you know, give it up. Um, <laughs> But I have sleep apnea, okay, you know, as you know, some people have sleep apnea, and I do. Um, so this one does a really good job of, you know, telling me that I have, you know, episodes of sleep apnea, you know, during the night. So, so that's why I like, you know, to keep this one also. Yep. Hmm? Um, this one was a is a Fitbit. When I bought it, it was a hundred fifty bucks or so. You know, maybe hundred twenty. You know, I bought this at Costco or some other place when where it's actually less expensive. Um, this one I bought it on eBay, not eBay, Amazon. Um, it's like forty bucks. <laughs> They're getting down to forty bucks now. If you don't want the name brand and you know all the, you know all the cool things that come with the name brand, you know they they get down to like forty bucks now. Yep. Does that one give you like a sleep quality? Both do, okay? Sometimes they agree and sometimes they do not agree. <laughs> this one also does a uh, heart rate variability, which is um, the consistency you know, between heartbeats. So when that is not consistent, you know, it usually means you're either stressed out or you know, you're emotionally not you know, at a calm place, okay? So this one does that and this one does not. <clears throat> yep. The lights. So there's the black things on top. Those are just like the, the, the sensors, right? Oh, the traffic lights. The traffic okay. Light. Mm -hmm. The black things on top are like the sensors, right? They sense the traffic. I do not know for sure because I know that the, the traffic lights have a way to detect whether a car is close to the intersection. So, you know, some lights, you know, will basically continuously keep green on one direction and it will only turn red when cars are, you know, detected, you know, cross it, trying to cross it. So I know they have some sort of detection mechanism. Yep. I these sensors were in the ground under, yeah. They, that's what they used to have. I'm not sure whether they have newer technology that does not rely on underground coils, basically. Um, because underground coils are good, they're reliable, but to service those things is difficult. You have to dig it up. So if they have a way to detect, you know, cars reliably, you know, using something that's mounted onto the, the bar that holds the traffic light, that's a lot easier to surface. Um, and also uh, wireless um, home security stuff, you know, do you guys know about that stuff too? Okay, so you just buy, you know, um, kind of like a wireless, you know, thing, you know, they come in all kinds of, you know, all different types of sensors, but the most typical one would be one that uh, uses a magnet on one side, and then when, you, when your door closes, you know, the magnet will be detected, and then it sends a RF signal to a main controller to let the main controller know that you know uh, it, the, the switch has is closed. Okay, um, I got those things installed in my house, and I originally I thought, okay, I have to change the batteries like every few months, which is a big hassle. Okay, nope. Like two, three years later, you know, the, the original battery is still going strong, and you know, in part, it has to do with using you know. Um, MCUs or microcontroller units like this kind, probably not this kind because it needs a little bit more programming to uh, communicate with a Zigbee, you know, um, uh, protocol. 
but you know, things are going in, in, in also that sort of direction. The Internet of Things is one thing, you know, but you know, there, there are also other types of wireless connectivity between you know, um, you know, gadgets. And some of those can be powered by lower um, you know, processors you know, that do not have you know, all the resources. So are we doing okay with this? Cool. So I just want to show you this because this is what I did, you know, before I started to teach full time. You know, I was a uh, software engineer with an embedded system developer, you know, company, and uh, that's basically what the company made. Yep. Yeah, I would say so. Until they promoted me to management, <laughs> that sucked all the fun, all the fun out of it. They they had to use a PA to find me when there are meetings. Because I will be hiding in somebody's cubicle. <laughs> um, the people that I was going to go in charge of, you know, those were not the, they, they were not the issue. The issue were the other managers. Nope, no, don't have that issue anymore. So this is a smaller package. You know, um, I think this is one of the uh, maybe four by four millimeter one. Oh. Yep. Yep. So a Fitbit is a little bit more complex, but in theory you can. You know, the the most difficult part is to miniaturize it um, because you have the display, you have the battery, you have the Bluetooth, you know, stack. So you need some kind of processor that is capable of talking Bluetooth 4.0, you know, which is not difficult. You can find plenty of processors that can do it. The problem is miniaturizing it, you know, which means you know the packaging becomes everything. You know, what kind of battery are you going to use? You know, what screen are you going to use, and how do you integrate all of that stuff? But to get something that's just functional, but not necessarily you know like you know, really kind of as small as it can get. You can't put something together. I mean, these days, you know, it wouldn't be too difficult to put something together. Um, because you can find uh, Bluetooth uh, modules. So, you know, a processor like this, like this type can communicate directly with a Bluetooth module. So the Bluetooth module is, is kind of self-contained as a solution. So now all you have to do is to figure out your, a protocol. You know, okay, you know, how do you um, establish you know, connection and how do you transmit the data and how do you communicate with a uh, mobile device? Mobile devices have you know Bluetooth. You know, usually, I think every single mobile device has Bluetooth now. And the Bluetooth stack allows you to do uh, serial communication, which means you know you just it's just C in C out. Okay, you know from the perspective of C plus plus, so you're just receiving a stream and you're outputting a stream. You know, so anything that works in a sequence of bytes would work. So, you know, so absolutely, you can actually do the entire thing, um, including the mobile app side, you know, it's entirely possible. The Design Hub actually has a project like that right now. You know, some uh, inventor has a, um, has a breath analyzer, but not for alcohol, but for ketone. So this is for athletes, you know, because I think for whatever reason, you know, the amount of ketone, you know, detected in breath, reflects how much blood sugar or some other things that athletes are you know want to know so you know they want to uh, market a device where you can just breathe into it and they can report back you know the amount of ketone in the breath yep so you mentioned there's no specific class for, you, for learning circuitry mm -hmm. you also mentioned that you were an engineer that made these how did you learn did they just teach you when you got the job or yep pretty much on the job yep that was uh, that was huh well, until you go to school, you know, a lot of the stuff that I needed to work on would be, would be would not be possible because I had to maintain the compiler, okay? So without taking, a, you know, at least, I, I took at least two compiler classes, maybe three, including a graduate level class. So with that experience, you know, you can give me just about any compiler and I'll be able to figure out how it works and how to extend it, how to fix bugs and so on. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I also... Okay, so when you think about a compiler, a compiler's job eventually is to crank out opcode, right? You know, that's what you guys are all doing you know, in this class, is you're cranking out opcode. 
So without understanding opcode assembly language programming and whatnot, I would not be able to maintain the compiler to, you know, to you know, fix bugs and whatnot. So the education you know, gives you all that background you know, to, 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 do the, to do that job. Now, what I did learn in addition to what I already knew at the time um, was a particular architecture. I did not learn about the Z80 architecture in my classes. But all processes, you know, share you know certain common instruction set, you know, like conditional branches, compare, you know, um, moving content from one location to from, from one register to another register, dereferencing. Those are all common to every single architecture. The way they combine into instructions would be slightly different. The mnemonics would be different. But in terms of concept, they're all there. It's just like variations from one from one to another. So that gave me you know, the, the background knowledge that I needed in order to say, oh, this is a new architecture, but I can learn about the new architecture because I have the fundamentals down already. So I would say you know, it's still important to get a, uh, in for that particular job, it would still be important to get a, a bachelor's degree in computer science with an emphasis on uh, computer architecture and also compilers. Is that okay? All right, so we dig I digressed a lot, you know, in today's class, but I think it is still related to you know what I'm teaching, which is you know computer architecture and assembly language programming, because I don't want you guys to think that you know assembly language programming is just something an item that you have to check off, you know, on your you know on your way to a four year university. It by itself actually has you know uh, applications in industry. All right, so let's check the time. We still got a few, you know, about half an hour, so that's good. Okay, so getting back to the notes. Okay, so we're done with this one. You know, this is an easy one. <clears throat> and then we'll move on to the next one, which is going to be a little bit harder. So we are moving on to vari uh, local variables and parameters, which is this particular slide here. So your lab today, you know, the lab that is opened for today, you know, would also get into parameters and also local variables. And you might have noticed that the lab is not just lab, you know, it actually has instruction and also knowledge in it. So it's basically just, you know, a, another way of presenting the same material. So the first part has to do with, you know, parameters that is pushed on the stack. So we look at a call like this, okay. And let's see, where's the C code? Okay, so here's the C code. So the C code is we have a, a subtraction subroutine. Doesn't do anything other than you know, just returning the difference between X and Y. So I'm hoping that we all understand the C code. Yes? Okay. So now the question is how do we implement this in assembly? So as it turns out, the parameters are also pushed on the stack. So in this case, when you call, when a caller calls subtract, the caller is responsible to push y and x on the stack. Okay. So let's let me just scroll back a little bit because this is from the perspective of the subroutine, but from the from the perspective of the caller, this is what it looks like. This is the caller calling subtract three five. And it is not in an assignment operation, which means I'm tossing away the result of subtracting uh, five from three um, without using it. Okay, but the focus is how do we pass parameters when we're performing a function call? So when we look at the assembly code, we will see you know bunch. You know we can look at groups of instructions instead of individual ones. So when you look at this group of instruction, these three together. They together basically pushes a constant of five on the stack. Are we convinced of that? Okay. All right. So the next three from line four to line six is you know kind of very similar. It pushes your know, three on the stack. So that means five is at a higher location on the stack, and three is right below it. Does that make sense to you? Because the stack grows from high memory address to low memory address. Is that okay? Then what do we do uh, on line seven? From line seven to line ten, that's the typical call thing. Okay, we push the return address, which is labeled you know, right after the JMPI, onto the stack. 
So now we have three items on the stack. Is that okay? So the three items on the stack from high location to low location would be parameter of what we use to pass to argument y, what we pass to parameter x, and also the return address. Those three things are on the stack when we do the JMPI to subtract. Is that okay? So what do we do when we get to subtract? So when we get to subtract, okay, this part is a, is a little bit more complex, but we can track down what we're doing here. So when we get to subtract here, the stack pointer would still be pointing at the return address because that was the last thing that we pushed on the stack, right? Yes, okay. And then what I do here is I'm just adding one to C, which is the same thing as just incrementing C. Now, C is not a stack pointer. C has no purpose assigned to it. C is just one of the available registers. So now C is no longer pointing to the return address. It would be pointing to the byte above the return address. Is that okay? What is that? That's parameter. Okay. So C would be pointing to parameter X on line four. On line five, we go to that location and retrieve what C is pointing to. So that means on line four, at the end of line four, C is the address of parameter X. When we get to line five, A becomes the value of parameter X. Are we still following this okay? Okay, so later on, I can give you a different uh, representation. Um, this kind of code also works really well in a trace analyzer because it, the, the trace analyzer would actually show you what is being read and what is being written to. So that would actually be helpful too. On line six, we increment C again. C was pointing to X on the stack. What is right above um, X? Y, parameter Y. So on line six, C now becomes the address of parameter Y. And then we load uh, whatever C is pointing to into B. So that means B is now the value of parameter Y. Are we still doing okay? So this requires you to kind of mentally keep track of what is on the stack, okay? Um, and then we do a subtraction because A, according to this, is the value of X and B is the value of Y. And that's what the, what the C code wants to do is to subtract Y from X, okay? To, to well, figure out what is the difference between the two. So after the subtraction, the result is in A already, which is good because what is the special purpose of A again? Register A? for the return value. So the return value is already in A after line eight, so we are good over there. <clears throat> so line 10 to line 14 are the typical return from a subroutine. In other words, we just retrieve the return address, put it into a register, and then we just jump to whatever that register is pointing to. So that concludes the execution of the subroutine, which is not the conclusion of everything because we still got something to clean up. What is still on the stack at this point? Three and five, exactly. So those things are still on the stack. Do we have any need of those values on the stack at this point? Nope. So that means you know, they have to be cleaned up, but they are not cleaned up by the subroutine. They're cleaned up by the caller. So that's why you know, after the JMPI instruction, we have two additional increment Ds in order to get rid of the arguments that we push on the stack earlier. This is from seen from the perspective of the caller. So are we good with this stuff so far? Yep. Is there a reason why we don't reallocate the parameters in the, um, in the subroutine? subroutine? Because there are cases where you do not know how many arguments are on the stack. Okay, so I, I need to, since you asked the question, I'm going to illustrate what I mean by that. Okay, so let me just say that one more time and then we'll, I'll go ahead and illustrate that concept. <clears throat> so you can, uh, let me go to mouse pad. Okay. So in C and also C++, I'm pretty sure this is not usually introduced in CISP 360, so don't feel bad if this is not discussed in CISP 360. But you can do something like this. You can say int, you know, function f, um, and then you, you have to give it at least one parameter. So I'll give it one parameter like n.
but then you can use dot 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 okay so in this case the dot 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 is not just i'm saying oh there are some other arguments uh, some other parameters this is actual valid c syntax to specify a function that can have a variable number of arguments okay so the way to make use of this okay is if you look it up variable number of parameters in c <clears throat> or they call it variable length <coughs> so the sample code to do this you know is um, there are two special macros that will give you uh, the ability to move on to the next one and then the next one and then the next one um, but the big question is what are the types of those extra arguments that are passed to me nobody knows okay they're sitting somewhere on the stack but nobody actually knows the type of those things so then you have to think about okay what type am i expecting and then you have to interpret um, those extra bytes on the stack according to what you think you should be expecting from the subroutines perspective okay now, how many people were introduced to printf or scanf in CISP 360? Okay, a few. Okay, very good. So in that case, okay, I can I can just kind of use that as an example. So printf, you know, has a return value, but I'm going to ignore that. So printf, you know, allows you to specify something like this. Okay, I want to print a character, um, has an ASCII code of, and then percent %d for a signed integer. So you can do something like this as what we call a format string. So a format string allows you to specify um, places, placeholders. So percent %c is a placeholder that says, um, there's a character here, but we'll specify the character later. Percent %d specifies that we have a signed integer here, but we'll supply that value later. Okay, so the format string is just telling you, you know, what, what which part needs to be filled in with actual value. And then the rest of the string is just verbatim, okay? We have space, H, A, S, space, A, N, and so on. Okay, so that becomes the format string. So after the format string, you know, printf, now you have to supply the actual stuff, okay? So you have to supply the ASCII code of whatever you want to do, okay, like X here. And then you have to specify the integer version of X. So technically speaking, you can sort of do it like this, but this would not be the best way to do it. Because if you do it this way, then um, because the width of a character is only 8 bit, which means depending on the compiler, it might just be pushing 8 bits on the stack, which is okay if you if you're only expecting a character. But an integer is dependent on you know the architecture. Okay, you know how wide is an integer? Is it the same width as a character? We don't know. Okay, so the best way to do this is to cast the ASCII code of X into an int first because the type int int is always matching your know, what percent d is expecting on the stack so this is how you make that and you can also see how this makes use of a variable length of parameters because the more placeholders you have in the format string the more extra stuff you have to supply in order for printf to work does that make any sense but this format string itself is also telling you how you can you, how you need to interpret what is following the format string itself. So this is one of those really odd stuff that you can do in C and C++. It is usually not talked about a whole lot in the C and C++ class. But this is the reason, okay? This is the reason for two things. This is why we push arguments from last to first. Okay? Because we need to get to the first one. So if you push everything from last to first, the first one always has a fixed offset from where the stack pointer points to. Even if you have you know, 20 arguments one time and then 10 arguments next time, the first argument, because it's pushed last, it is always right next to the return address. So that's one reason why we have um, the idea of pushing arguments from last to first. But this also explains why the caller not the callee is responsible to deallocate the, ar the, the, the arguments because the callee does not know, okay? If you think of printf in this case, printf does not know how many things you have pushed. 
it knows that there, are, there should be at least three things. But if you supply extra stuff after this, it doesn't know. So it would not know how much to deallocate. But the caller, on the other hand, always knows how many arguments were pushed. So that's why it's a split responsibility when it comes to deallocating things. The subroutine always deallocates the return address because that is quote unquote consumed by the, by, by the subroutine. But the arguments, on the other hand, are always deallocated by the caller. Are we okay with these concepts? Okay. So let's go ahead and just you know, enter that program and then we'll go ahead and uh, put it into LogiSim and then we'll see how it works. Okay. So we'll go back to the module. Right here. Yep. Okay. Okay. So we'll go ahead and write this in a way that it will run, you know, with the trace analyzer, which means we have to start with a no op. <clears throat> Technically speaking, even though it's not needed, you know, you should always you know, initialize the stack pointer to zero because you know zero is actually one zero zero in disguise. <clears throat> and this is main. Okay. So main officially starts here. You know, and then main doesn't do a whole lot in this case. It just calls subtract without using the return value, okay? Which is okay. C allows you to make use of call a function and ignore the return value. So this is what we'll do is uh, we'll do LDI. I cannot just copy and paste you know, because uh, copy and pasting would also copy the line number. So that's why you know, I need to kind of hand type this. But as I hand type, I can also use this as an opportunity opportunity to you know kind of talk about what it's doing so these three lines would push the value of five on the stack okay push five which is parameter y which is the second parameter and then we have the same kind of instruction to push three on the stack this is parameter x and then we'll modify this instruction a little bit. We'll say LDI A with a dot five plus, okay? Yeah, because we know that, that trick already. <clears throat> Decrement D, JMPI to subtract. And we don't need this label anymore because of the dot five plus. So now we can just go ahead and increment D twice. And that will be, then we get to the halt instruction. This is the end of main. So now we write subtract, okay? So when we write subtract, um, there are several ways to do this. I'm just gonna use exactly the same way so we can just uh, run this code the way it is. But there are other ways to do this. Um, I will use increment because when the note was written, increment as an in instruction did not exist at that point. But now that it does, we can just say increment. And I'm going to specify what C is. So at this point, C is the address of the return address. I know it sounds you know, kind of um, confusing, but that's exactly what it is because the return address is on the stack and register C points to the return address. That's why C is the address of the return address. Okay, yep. You basically just switch D to C. You're using C as a counting, but I'm using... Yeah, I cannot move D around, okay? And there are reasons why I cannot move D around, but C is not a stack pointer, right, which you is... You want to keep D at a point, but, yep. but to use it within the subroutine, you want Correct. to use C as a counter. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Because D is a stack pointer, you know, on an, any architecture that has interrupts, you don't want to move the stack pointer around. Now, with this architecture, because I have not implemented uh, interrupts yet, so it's not as important, but as a convention, you know, you don't move the stack around, the stack pointer around, unless you know that that is not something you need anymore, then you can increment. So now C becomes the address of um, X, which is right on top of uh, the return address. And then we do a LDAC, which means register A is the value of X, not the address of X. And then we increment D again which means your C becomes the address of Y. And then we do LDBC, which means C, I mean, excuse me, B is now you know, the value of Y. Then we do a subtraction. 
which means register A is now x minus y. So that means I have the, uh, the return value you know, specified at this point. Then we do a LD BD. B is now the return address. And then the rest is just to you know, um, deallocate the return address on the stack and a JMPB to continue execution in uh, the caller. So are we good with this stuff so far? Okay. So I know this code is slightly different from the one in the module, but functionally they are the same. Are there any questions before I copy and paste it into the assembler and get it assembled and run it? Yep. Number line? Which one? On the first one. Here? The main module? Um, number nine here. Oh, right. Okay. You are correct. So we need to store to the, okay. I forgot. <laughs> so without that, you know, very strange things would happen because, you know, um, I would now be using, so when I get to the subtract, because I only push two items on the stack. The third one was never stored. So the memory location is reserved, but it was never stored, which means I have some leftover value on the stack that I'll be using as the return address. And guess what? When you reset RAM, everything is zeroed out. So instead of returning back to here, it'll be returning to the beginning of the entire program. So the program becomes a quote infinite loop because it would just keep doing this over and over again. <clears throat> okay, that's a good catch. So let's go ahead and control A, control C, and then we go to the assembler. It's a, probably a good idea to learn how to use um, the um, trace analyzer because you know, from here on, you know, in order to help you understand how the stack is used you know, and also help you debug a program, the uh, trace analyzer is actually very useful for that. All right, so we just remove the other program and I put in this particular program Wait for it to fully assemble everything. And we go to RAM file. Download as CSV. Subtract. Okay. All right. So now it's time to run it. Um, so I can cheat a little bit because I can find out, you know, how I ran the previous one. <laughs> and I can just copy and paste it and go back and change just the part that I need to change, which is really just the name of the CSV. You know, this one is SUV and everything else I can keep the same. So if you want to do this on a PC, uh, what you want to do is to put the jar file um, the processor files, you know, there are three of those, and also the RAM file into the same folder. And then you can zip up that folder and you know, upload the zip file to Google Drive. So then you can retrieve that, everything, including you know, the jar file to any computer and be able to run it on any computer. And because everything is in the current, in, in the same folder, you don't have to specify the path anymore. So, yep. Yes, CMD is the same thing as basically, it's basically the shell of you know, a particular system. So, so now it's all done. And then we switch back to um, the trace analyzer. <clears throat> all right, so we go to file, we go to import, upload. Yeah, I know there are a few clicks to get this done, but 
it's worth the time, you know, because you know it eventually it will save you a lot of time. Replace current sheet, tab only, and say no to convert. And then we switch to analysis. All right. So when you look at the trace, uh, the output of the trace analyzer, um, you can see how the stack pointer gets. Okay, it, it just takes a little bit of time. It's still running. Yep. I think it's. Is it done now? Yep. It's. Still, it's not done yet. It's still it's calculating. It. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Well, if you look into the actual equation of the spreadsheet, it's not something that's really easy to do. Um, so that's why it takes a while to finish the computation. So the register D is actually initialized in uh, at location one, but it, does, it doesn't show up because register D start off with a value of zero to begin with. So when we store a zero in which already had a value of zero, it doesn't get reflected you know, in the trace analyzer. So that's why it didn't show up. <clears throat> On the other hand, when I initialize register A to 5, it shows up here. And um, let's see, go down a little bit. This is when we decrement the stack pointer to FF from 0, 0. And then we store something into location FF, which is the 0, 5. So the way you read this is, okay, first of all, the column header tells you that you know anything on this column is reflecting something that is written to RAM. But the second thing that tells you this is a write to RAM is we have star FF, which is dereferencing FF, and this is an assignment operator, and the value is 0, 5. Everything is by default hexadecimal, so I don't bother to use 0x in front of everything. Is that okay? Does everybody understand how to read a cell you know, in these columns? Okay. So this is how we push a five on the stack, and then we put a three into register A. We decrement the stack pointer again to FE this time, and then we store that onto the stack as well. So the zero three is now at location F3, excuse me, FE on in memory. So you can kind of, if you want to, you can actually keep track of a separate table to see what is the current content on the stack and what the stack pointer is pointing to. The stack pointer is register D, so we know the last update is you know register D or the stack pointer is FE. Then we push something else, okay? Then we initialize A to one zero in hexadecimal. That's our return address. And then we decrement the stack pointer again, this time to FD, and then we store the return address also on the stack. So if you you know, draw a map of the content of the stack, then we have the return address. On top of that, we have X, and then on top of that, we have Y. So those are the locations that we have already stored in, uh, in RAM. Then we continue execution in the subroutine because you can see how the PC jumped from F, uh, 0F to 1.4. So that can only be because of a branch instruction. So after the branch, we make a copy. We copy register D to register C. Register D is already FD, and now register C is also FD because we have CPR or copy register. After that, we increment um, register C, so it is now pointing to FE. But if you remember from earlier, okay, location FE has three. And that three is now stored in register A because of the LD instruction. Then we increment um, C again, so it is pointing to FF. And then we use the reference um, so that you know, we look at the value of location FF in RAM, which is five, and then we put that into register B. Then we do the subtraction. When we perform the subtraction, two things happen. One thing is A, you know, register A is now the difference between A and B, which is three minus five. Three minus five is negative two, and FE is in fact negative two, because FE is one, 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 zero, which is one less than one, 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 but we know one, 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 one represents negative one if we want to look at it as a signed value. So we know it makes sense. But you can also see the flags got changed too. If you do not see a flag here, it means it is remained the same as before, which is a zero because everything started off as zeros. The carry flag is set because this subtraction takes a borrow. If you look at um, the values as unsigned values, it, it, re, it re required one borrow. 
The sine flag is a one because if you look at F as the most significant nibble or the most significant hexadecimal digit, it is one, 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 which, which means bit seven is a one. So the sine bit is one. The L flag is a one also because it is the exclusive or between the sine flag and the overflow flag. The overflow is a zero. The sine is a one. One exclusive or with zero is a one. So all of this stuff gets reflected. And then what we do is we retrieve whatever the stack pointer is pointing to, which is now just the return address. So the return address is one zero that is now stored in register B. And then we increment the stack pointer because we have just used whatever is at that location. Now, if you want to know where did we read this, you can look at this too. So this is why the trace analyzer is really helpful because not only do we know that register B got changed to one zero in hexadecimal, we also know where it got it, which is location FD in RAM. Okay. <clears throat> so then we increment the stack pointer over here. It goes from FD to FE, and then we continue execution at look. So one C is the JMP instruction. After that, we continue execution at one zero because that's what we put into register B before the JMP B instruction. And at this point, we just have to clean up the stack because we got two more bytes of arguments on the stack. So we will see that, um, oh, that's the, wait, there should be a little bit more stuff. <laughs> oh, hmm, that is. You, you, you increment D to deallocate the values in A and D so that it just resets, right? Yeah, but it should reflect um, the increment of D here. So unless I made a mistake somewhere and did not do that. No, I got the two F. I got the two DFs here. So they should be there. Um, okay. Yeah, the halt instruction is at location zero one, but it is apparently not incrementing D. Hmm. I will have to take a look at it because this is not, and the program counter should also increment as well. So a few things do not add up. I'm going to have to take a look at this. <laughs> it could be a bug in the uh, debugger. It could be a bug in the trace analyzer. So and if we are out of time in today's class. The lab is already released. Um, I think it has a passcode of, I cannot remember the passcode. Hmm? Yeah. I was hoping that I would be able to remember the passcode, but I could not. Stack operations parameters. No, this is the wrong class, right? No, it is. Okay, maybe it's an old. It's function call. Oh, that means I skipped one. <laughs> I didn't see the other one. Okay, I'll open up the other one first. Okay, because I think this one is easier than the uh, uh, the function call one. I'll open it up when we get to the lab. I should probably check my uh, heart rate variability last night. <clears throat>